We have just witnessed Sharish Niknum's mother's lament at her son's grave. Sharif Niknum was a 33-year-old Kurdish man from Mahabad who was shot and killed during the current uprising in Iran. Videos of Sharif's mother and wife reciting laments at his funeral and burial have gone viral and are one of the many moving scenes of the current uprising. The lament is an ancient oral genre of poetry mostly performed by women, occasionally by men, in which the mourner expresses their grief in poetry. These laments are long and they are improvised on the spot. They tell in metaphoric language, the griever's relationship to the deceased, their hopes, their aspirations, their legacy. Here is a tiny section of this moving lament translated for us by one of our guests, Dr. Farangis Gaderi. Sharish's Lament. Oh God, I had a dove, the dove, the dove. My dear child left the nest, leaving me here to wonder which tree in heaven he has settled on, holds him now, he rests in now. I can't return him to the nest no matter what I do. Oh, my dear child, may your enemy sit in my place. May that divisive, that bloodthirsty enemy, oh, my dear child, may he come to the same end as I. I say, my dear child, I bring you doctors, doctors from Tehran and Tabriz, and my child answers, they cannot cure my wounds. Sing me instead a lullaby as you breastfeed me. Wake up from your sleep, my dear child, I say. My child, the sun rises, but it is a dark of night for me. Oh, my bright star is in the sky and does not return to my bosom, no matter what I do. We welcome you all here tonight with full hearts and thank you all so much for supporting and attending Poetry Mesa's presentation of Poetry and Revolution, Iranian Women Changing the World. My name is Catherine Marenghi, co-founder of the Poetry Mesa, and I am here tonight with my co-host and co-founder, the luminous poet, Judith Hill. Welcome. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us for this important presentation. Improvising poetry and grief, as you just saw, and in joy, is part of the endangered Kurdish heritage and language, a tradition that speaks to the power of poetry to grieve, to resist, to uplift, explore, and to connect, and offers us an opportunity 
to share and honor the heart and soul of a people, which is what we're here to do tonight. Shorish's mother, Lament, reaches back to the ancient underpinnings of all poetry all over the world and reminds us that the origin and destiny of poetry has always and ever been incantatory and necessary. In fact, the first poem ever written was written by a woman in Samaria in praise of the moon goddess Inanna, and where is this? Where is Samaria? In southern Iran. So today we are looking at the modern and postmodern blossoming of an ancient, ancient tradition of voices that cross worlds. Today we come together to explore and celebrate these voices and also to grieve. For we are brought together by a death at the hands of Iran's infamous morality police. Jina Masa Amini, the 22-year-old Kurdish woman whose death was the spark that kindled steady flames of revolution in Iran into a bonfire. Ever since Jina Masa Amini was arrested for showing a few strands of hair for not wearing her hijab properly, Iran has been rocked by an incendiary uprising in the face of mortal danger led by young people, ethnic minorities, and women. And Gina was all three of these. Her name, Gina, the name that her heartbroken mother cried out over and over at her funeral is important to this story. Like many Kurds, Gina had two names, an authentic one that connected her to her suppressed heritage and an assimilated one that was meant to protect her. At Gina's funeral in Sakez, Kurdistan province, the slogan, which is the heart and heat of the Iran uprising, women, life, freedom, was chanted, a refrain that now echoes around the world calling for an end to gender, ethnic, economic, and political oppression in Iran. Woman, life, freedom is a Kurdish slogan. Jin, Jian, Azadi. Linguistically, the word Jina shares the same roots as the word for woman, Jin, and life, Jian. Jina means a giver of life, and Gina, whose hair was judged by the authorities to be improperly covered by the hijab, has brought a movement to life. Her grave is inscribed with the words, Dearest Gina, you shall not die. Your name will be a symbol. In Iran, poets have the ear and heart of the people, making them dangerous to any authoritarian regime. This is a literary tradition that we've seen in Spain with Garcia Lorca and the Hungarian-born Arthur Kessler, in Russia with many, many poets, including Anna Akhmatova, and recently in the current coup in Myanmar, where the generals imprisoned more than 30 poets and at least four have been killed. So we ask, what is it to be the voice of resistance as a poet in your country? And our four writers today know well the answer to that question. Today, we have the honor of hearing the voices of four brilliant and courageous Iranian writers, authors, poets, scholars. Ava Homa, Dr. Fatemeh Shams, Fatemeh Ektesari, and Dr. Farangis Gaderi, all of whom are currently living in exile from their homeland exploring with us both ancient and current literary traditions in Iran and providing historical and literary context. We'll have a short Q&A at the end and the Q&A button is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We invite you to feel free to put your questions there during this entire presentation. And now please sit back, relax, and be ready to hear this incredible presentation we have for you tonight. We begin our presentation with, and this is a new element for us, a novelist. Abahoma 
is a celebrated novelist whose work is not only linguistically marvelous, lyrical, and passionate, uh, but she herself is crucial to our conversations today. Welcome, Abba. Uh, hi, it doesn't allow me to start my video. It says the host has stopped it. If you allow my video to please be turned up, start my video. Thank you, host. Hello, everyone. This is such an honor to be here. Thank you for that warm introduction. Um, really in depth so to the organizers. I know how hard and fiercely you've all worked to make today happen. Thank you to the fellow panelists and to all of you in the audience for spending your time. Well, welcome, Ava. Ava Homa is an award-winning novelist, a journalist, and an activist. Her words have appeared in The Globe and Mail, BBC, The Guardian, Literary Hub, Literary Review of Canada, and more. She has spoken about women's rights across North America and Europe, including at the United Nations in Geneva. Ava has a master's degree in creative writing from the University of Windsor, and her debut novel, Daughters of Smoke and Fire, the story of a Kurdish woman's search for justice and freedom, won the 2020 Nautilus Book Award, was a finalist for the 2022 William Saroyan International Writing Prize, and was Roxane Gay's book club pick. Ava, I was so moved by your novel and by your powerful and eye-opening essay, Unveiling Through Voice, Writing as Resistance by Iranian Women. Especially, I love this quote of yours, once I started to write myself, I began to realize how this powerful act of self-expression was the counter opposite of the seclusion, alienation, and repression that mandatory veiling had imposed on me. And you coined that fabulous phrase, unveiling through voice. I wonder if you might share some of the historical intersection of women, poetry, and resistance in Iran. Um, thank you, Judith, for your kind remarks, and thanks, Catherine, for the introduction. Yeah, it's uh, very important to me that when um, oppression thinks that it has won and it has silenced people, artists and creators and intellectuals and activists find ways around that and find new ways to express themselves. I think it's no coincidence that in modern Iranian history, the first woman in uh, modern times who publicly unveiled herself was a poet. Tahira Qurat al Ain from the Baha'i religious minority showed up without her veiling as a man's gathering, but it's important that her presence was also voice, that she had initially found self expression through voice. Another poet that's very important to me uh, is Fulukh Farrokhzad. Uh, she was also, she has been one of the most, um, both the revere and reviled poets of mid-20th mid century in Iran. Um, she had a short and remarkable life, and she also, because she broke a lot of shackles that society has put on women's hand and feet, she became such a subject of controversy. On one hand, she was highly admired, on the other hand, she was really feared. And I pay tribute to these authors and a lot of authors, especially the very little known Kurdish authors and poets in my book, Daughters of Smoke and Fire, because it's important for me to remind myself the reason I can do today what I can is because I stand on the shoulder of giants, but there have been so many other authors and women and poets who have, who have fought and paid for it heavily, like Shora is paying, Shora's mother is paying by creating a little bit of space for the rest of us today. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's marvelous. I mean, would you tell us some more about Farouk? She seems to be the mother of modern Iranian poetry. Is that true? Um, and, and if so, would you read one of her poems? Yeah, it's absolutely true. She is uh, initially the Islamic Republic when they took over in 1979. For about 10 years, they banned her poetry. And but that made her even a more and more a subject of curiosity. I mean, for me growing up, she was the icon of uh, personal freedom, sexual freedom, and also artistic liberation. She, her, she had a short and tormented life. So as I'm saying, she really paid a heavy price for it, but she paved the way for the rest of us. And I'll be honored to read her poem, Another Birth.
My whole being is a dark chain which will carry you, perpetuating you to the dawn of eternal growth and blossoming. In this chant, I sighed you, sigh. In this chant, I grafted you to the tree, to the water, to the fire. Life is perhaps a long street through which a woman holding a basket passes every day. Life is perhaps a rope with which a man hangs himself from a branch. Life is perhaps a child returning home from school. Life is perhaps lighting up a cigarette in the narcotic repose between two lovemakings or the absent gaze of a passerby who takes off his hat to another passerby with a meaningless smile and a good morning. Life is perhaps that enclosed moment when my gaze destroys itself in the people of your eyes and it is in the ceiling which I will put into the moon's impression and the night perception. In a room as big as loneliness, my heart, which is big as love, looks at the simple pretexts of its happiness, at the beautiful decay of the flowers in the vase, at the sapling you planted in our garden, at the song of canaries which sing to the sides of a window. Ah, this is my lot, this is my lot, this is my lot. My lot is a sigh which is taken away at the drop of a curtain. My lot is going down a flight of diffused stairs, a regain something amidst petrification and nostalgia. My lot is a sad promenade in the garden of memories and dying in the grief of a voice which tells me, I love your hands. I will plant my hands in the garden. It will grow, I know, I know, I know, and swallows will lay eggs in the hollow of my ink-stained hand. I shall wear a pair of twin cherries as my earrings, and I shall put dial-up petals on my fingernails. There is an alley where the boys who were in love with me still loiter with the same unkempt hair, thin necks, and bony legs. And think of the innocent smile of a little girl who was blown away by the wind one night. There is an alley which my heart has stolen from the streets of my childhood. The journey of a form along the line of time, inseminating the line of time with the form, a form conscious of an image coming back from a feast in a mirror. And it is in this way that someone dies and someone lives on. No fisherman shall ever find a pearl in a small brook which empties into a pool. I know a sad little fairy who lives in an ocean and ever so softly plays her heart into a magic flute, a little sad fairy who dies with one kiss each night and is reborn with one kiss each dawn. Life is perhaps lighting up a cigarette in the narcotic repose between two love. Love me. Oh, <laughs> I'm so grateful to you for turning me on to Farouk's work. Um, I bought her books and now I'm reading her. Thank you for this so much. You uh, love it. What a pleasure. <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to ask you about was in your essay, Unveiling the Voice, you speak so eloquently about your own unveiling. And I wonder if you might just say a little more of that and then maybe read for us a bit from Daughters of Smoke and Fire and the epigraph. I love the epigraph. Thank you. I'll be honored to. Yes, it was really hard growing up in a misogynistic and utterly uh, chauvinistic country growing up as a woman and as a Kurdish a woman, a Kurdish minority. And so it, it felt very suffocating. And it was in literature when I found a redemptive world where I could take a pause and uh, peel layers and understand maybe how things were the way they were. But as I read, I was also a very curious reader. And as I read more and more of Persian literature and literature in English as I went to college and learned English, I realized that no one has written Kurdish women into literature. And I thought it's upon us to do that. And I'm so happy that Fang is here today and I have been able to do the same thing. And so I wrote the story of what it's like to be a Kurd in Iran in Daughters of Smoke and Fire. 
And when Gina's story happened, and I knew that, like the quote you mentioned, Judith, she's not going to die, she will transcend. And that in that transcendence, I have given her a home in literature. And so Daughters of Smoke and Fire is so, in so many ways a tribute to someone like Gina, to a lot of women who fight on the page and off the page. And the uh, one page that I would read for you from the prologue is the story of Layla. Layla uh, likes to become a filmmaker and tells the story of her people to the world, but obstacles pile up. Her brother, Shia, uh, attends a protest and he's kidnapped. And now it's upon Layla to try and see where he is and what has happened to him. And while doing that, she puts her own life in danger. So this is a very difficult moment for her, this part that I'm going to read to you. A woman alone on the mountain at dusk. An invisible boot pressed against my throat, making my breath labored and helpless. And yet I could not go back and face my parents or my stifled future. Hidden behind the boulder, I hugged my knees and imagined my rage and peril whirling into a wildfire, burning down all the injustices. Could my father have known what was going on? I wanted to tell him to share this burden with him. My shoulders were already heavy beneath the daily cruelties of living as a woman in Lanatawa, the damn place. This fatigue was incurable. The sun had sauntered down, disappeared behind Lake Zrebar, a dozen shades of red burst open along the horizon. Below, the narrow winding asphalt road was the hem around the hill grain skirt, embroidered with clusters of red and yellow wildflowers. The schler flowers, the crown lilies, stood elegant and tall, flourishing across the rough Kurdistan plateau, defying borders. I yearned to be a Schler, but I was a garden of anguish, of loathing, of torment. My occupied homeland was a birthplace of death. I stood up, my breath not now coming in pants. I wasn't hiding anymore. Best of best, I shouted, it's enough, enough. I started down the hill in a tumbling round and found, my, found myself unable to stop. Despite the chill of the evening, I started sweating. The wind whipped my headscarf and I gained speed. I flapped as if I had wings. As I ran, a wail escaped my chest. I was headed toward the main road, toward the world of men. The streets belong to men, judgmental men, hypocritical men. Their honor depended on women, men. Cars hurtled around the curve, full of drunk drivers who honked as they spotted me sprinting down the hillside. Those drivers were going too fast for this road, too fast for their old sluggish reflexes, too fast for their vehicles. A white late model car careened down the winding road, kicking up dust. The wind roared in my ears. The white car and whoever was driving it seemed to seek me out as a fellow traveler. I stumbled on a stone crushing the shiny red poppies in the grass. And as I lurched, my untold stories humble inside me like pages ripped from a book and tossed crumpled into a waste paper bin. An overpowering urge to scream my story, to expel it from beginning to end seized me. Suddenly, I could see the head of all those curves crushed behind trunks. Descending the slope at a breakneck pace, my shouts crescendoing, I was unable to stop myself, this crazed woman. A final lunge, and I was airborne. Thank you so much. Oh, Ava. <laughs> Fabulous. That's really gorgeous writing. Um, a novel, but it really was poetry. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I actually grew up reading more poetry than fiction. So. We can really <laughs> the page. Thank you. Next, it is our great pleasure to introduce an extraordinary poet, Fatime Ekt 
Tesari. Welcome, Fatime. It's so great to see you. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be in your warm company while I'm sitting in cold Norway. <laughs> Fatime Ektesari is a, is a prize-winning poet, editor, human rights activist, and midwife from Iran. She has published 10 books, including poetry, short stories, and multi-genre books in both Persian and Norwegian. In 2015, and this is a very, very, very famous story, you guys, um, Fatime Ektesari fled Iran after being sentenced to 99 lashes and 11 and a half years in prison. And I just want to let you all know that um, when Fatime was, was sentenced, 100 poets in the United States signed, and over 100 poets, including like Robert Pinsky, Billy Collins, Tracy K. Smith, John Ashbery, all the poets in America wrote to the Ayatollah asking for her release. Um, but she'll tell you the rest of the story after that. But I am proud that at least we spoke up on her on her behalf at that time. And in, so in 2015, she fled Iran after her sentence and came to Little Hummer as a free city writer in 2017. So she is in Norway. Her poems have been translated into many, many languages. They're all over the internet. And she runs a Persian online magazine in addition to publishing her own texts to her many followers on social media. Fatime's latest poetry collection is She Is Not Woman, published in Persian and Norwegian. Yeah, thank you for the nice uh, presentation. <laughs> it's fun. Could you tell us a little bit more about the circumstances of your exile, if you can safely speak about it, and, and talk a bit about how you see the position of power and poetry in Iran? Yeah, sure. I can answer you in this way that uh, I was arrested three times in Iran for writing poetry and literary activity. I was in solitary confinement for 38 days in Evin prison. I went to the most unfair court for two years. And finally, I was sentenced to 11 and a half years in prison and 99 lashes as Judith uh, said. I got it just for the crime of writing and poetry. And after that, in order to be able to survive and uh, continue literature, actually, I escaped to Turkey illegally with the help of smugglers. Uh, and then I came to Norway as a guest writer on behalf of the ICORN organization. Well, uh, the Iranian regime knows well the power of poetry and literature. Uh, which puts so much, so much pressure on Iranian poet and writer. Uh, I'm just one example of a thousand. And if I want to say everything, I have to speak by night. And now it is still uh, 1 a.m. here. <laughs> um, it's my understanding that although we may not realize it in the English translations of your latest um, book, they, these are updated, what's called postmodern versions of the traditional guzzle, the, the traditional Persian form. And while usually we're used to the classic male writers who I, we love, and we love Rumi and Hafiz, we love them, but they write about spiritual matters, Sufism, Platonic love, and the imagined beloved, whereas the modern guzzel seems to really grab hold of our real life and the physical world. In your poems, you also refer to Farouk's poetry, who in the 50s, is my understanding, she started experimenting with shape-shifting the traditional guzzle, paving the way for what we now recognize as this postmodern guzzle. And, you know, I, of course, adore to know more of that. And I'm hoping that you will also share the title poem from your latest book, She Is Not Woman. And tell us, is that poem a guzzle? Is that one of them? 
Yeah, well, this poem has rhyme and rhythm, like classical Persian poems, but the content is not close to the archaic Persian poems in any way. <laughs> yeah, so I will read in Persian. Zannist, yek banafshe yavashast, va yek sukut gush kharashast. معجون نا امیدی و کاش است در گیجی زمیر خداگاه زن نیست مرد نیست عجیب است یک آرزوی روی صلیب است یک مشت سنگ داخل جیب است افتاده یک شب از وسط ماه زن مرد نیست جنسیتش باد فعلیست بین پا شد و افتاد گول است از چراغ خدازاد که حبس مانده داخل یک چاه رد کرده مرزهای بدن را جرداد پیش فرض شدن را کوتاه کرده سایه زن را از پشت پای یک من خودخواه بیگانه نیست مال زمین است مشکوک نیست عین یقین است از هر تماس سر زده مین است پنهان شده است در وسط راه یک پرتگاه در ته دنیاست آتش فشان داخل دریاست یک گور دست جمعی تنهاست یک شعر منتهی شده به آه Thank you. I'll read that in English. She is not woman. She's limp scarlet, is screaming silence, is serene despair, and oh, I wish in the buzz of conscious self. She is not woman, nor man, is an odd sight, is a hope tied on hands and feet, is hard stones in deep pockets, someone who fell from the sky at night, she is not she, he. Her gender is wind, is a verb between to stand and to tumble, is a genie released from a well-rubbed lamp, trapped in a deep well. She has crossed the borders of the body, torn the concept to be apart, cut off the female shadow from an eye consumed by itself. She is no stranger, belongs on this earth, isn't firm doubt, but solid certainty, is a mine hiding from strolling feet in the middle of a busy street. She is the leap at the end of the world. She is a volcano at the bottom of the sea. She is a lonely mass grave. She is a poem, a sigh. That poem is like a, it's like a riptide. Her gender is wind, is a verb between to stand and to tumble. Fatime, I was um, introduced to your work first on the internet through the poem Run. And I'm wondering, would you please share that as well? Sure, it's my pleasure. Farar kun تند رد شد از گوشم دوید یک نفر از توی ذهن مقشوشم فرار کن و خیابان شلوغ بود شلوغ فرار کن شب بی انتها صدای بوق صدای بوق پت از سالها فراموشی صدای بوق که پیشیده است در گوشی صدای بوق و یک عکس پاره در دستت صدای گم شدن از کوچه های بمبستت صدای گریه در آن چشم های ناباور صدای سوزش سیگار و گاز اشکاور صدای خوردن با توم بر سر و کمرت صدای حرکت یک مشت سای پشت سرت فرار کن دو سکوت صدا شده از هم صدای دست من و تو جدا شده از هم صدای تو که گذشت و صدای مردم شد صدای من که در آن روزهای بد گم شد 
صدای من که به راه فرار چسبیدم صدای من که به یک میز کار چسبیدم به قرد خوردن شب تا به صبح بیداری به صبح پا شدن از تخت خواب تکراری جلوی آین تمرین گریه و خنده بدون حوصل امضای چند پرونده به روزنامه دنبال یک خبر گشتن به ظهر خستگی از اداره برگشتن به یک سکوت که در هر اتاق منتظر است دو دست سر که با چای داغ منتظر است به روزهای بدی که به بدترم برسد به من که منتظرم تا که شوهرم برسد به من که منتظرم مثل یک زن خوشحال به پرت کردن جورا پاش گوشه حال فرار کن که صدا ریخت توی خانه من فرار کن کسی آهست زد به شانه من فرار کن به خیابان مردم عصبی فرار کن به زنی توی چادر عربی فرار کن به دو سایه رسیده از پشتت به ترس و پارچه ای سبز داخل مشتت فرار کن به تو که از گلوله میسوزی فرار کن به دو انگشت تلخ پیروزی به شب ادامه غمگینی از شب من و تو به خون خشک شده گوشه لب من و تو فرار کن به شب ناتمام آزادی به تو که در وسط دست هام جان دادی به زنده بودن تو بین این همه مرده به دست های من و تو به هم گره خورده صدام کن که تو ام مثل دست تو سردم صدام کن که به آن کوچه باز برگردم که آشقانه بخواند لبم در گوشت که گم شوم وسط خواب ها در آغوشت بیا و جان دوباره به خاطرات بده صدام کن و مرا از خودم نجات بده It's breathtaking work. It's breathtaking work. It's really a privilege to read this in English. Run! A voice passed by me and someone just ran inside my confused mind. Run! The streets were crowded and crowded. Run! The cars were honking in an endless night, honking after many years of forgetfulness, entering my ear and confusing my mind. I heard them honking and I kept a torn up picture in my hands. I heard the sound of being lost in all the dead end streets. I heard the sound of tears slipping down the rocked eyes. I heard the sound of tear gas and cigarettes all stinging. I heard the sound of batons meeting backs and heads. And I heard the shadows running behind me run. Two silences made a voice. The voice of our hands separated from each other, the voice of yours passing by me, the voice of yours becoming the voice of people and the voice of mine lost in all those bad days. I was sticking to a postern, sticking to my office, to my job, sticking to my pills in all those nights of insomnia and sticking to all those duplicated mornings. I used to wake up and practice my laughs and practice my cries with a duplicated mirror. I used to put on my impatient signature on the bottom of official papers. I used to look for one thing in all the newspapers impatiently. And I used to come back from the office in all the afternoons of impatience, coming back to the silence that welcomes you in every room, coming back to the cold hands that keep the hot cup of tea coming back to the bad days followed by worse and coming back to me waiting to welcome my husband like a happy wife who wants to welcome her husband waiting for him to throw his socks in the living room run my house is filled with the thrown away sounds run someone touched my shoulder you should run to the streets of madding crowd and to a woman in Arabian veil you should run to those two shadows behind behind you and to the fear of keeping a green wristband in your hand, you should run to yourself stung by a hot bullet 
and to your fingers of the V sign, you should run to the clotting blood in the corner of our lips and to the night, which is our sad resumption and to the incomplete night of liberty and to yourself dying in my arms, to yourself being alive among the dead and to our hands meeting each other again, call me. I am you. I am as cold as your hands. Call me. I want to come back to the streets. Call me to whisper in your ears with love. Call me to lose myself in your arms and in my dreams. Come back and resurrect the memories. Call me and rescue me from myself. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Fatima. What, what an incredible opportunity to read that poem. Thank you. Thank you, Judith and, and Fatima both. That was very moving. Uh, next, it's my privilege to introduce prize-winning poet, Fatima Shams. Welcome, Fatima. Hello, thank you. Fatime Shams is an internationally acclaimed poet with three poetry collections. When They Broke Down the Door from 2016, Writing in the Mist from 2014, and 88 from the year 2012. Her third bilingual book of poems won the Latife Yashater Annual Book Award in 2017. Some of her poems have appeared in the London Poetry Magazine, Penguin Anthology, Michigan Quarterly, Jacket 2, Penn Sound, Exiled Writers Magazine, Iran's Writers Association in Exile, Poetry Foundation, PBS, Life and Legends, MPT Magazine, and World Literature. Her poems have been translated into German, Kurdish, and Arabic. She holds a PhD in Oriental Studies from Oxford University and currently serves as Assistant Professor of Modern Persian Literature at the University of Pennsylvania. We're so glad you're here. And I know Thank you just- Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. And hi to everyone who is listening. It's a pleasure to be here. Yay, I know you were just teaching and you had to run to get to us and I'm so grateful to you for doing that. So I wanna, I, I also combed the internet and got to read a lot of your work. And I heard a terrific conversation on your work on the Poetry Foundation website. And to everyone watching, we're going to give a link to this in the handout that we're gonna send to all our registered audience later this week. In that, fabulous um, conversation about your work, one of the poets speaking said that you were quoted as saying, trauma causes forgetting and poetry is a way of unforgetting. Could you speak about this please in relation to your work as an activist and poet? Uh, sure, yeah, I think um, for uh, all our panelists who are here tonight, that's probably a very resonating line. Um, and I think for, um, particularly for those of us, uh, women poets and writers from the Middle East, and in this case from Iran, um, I think poetry as uh, Ava beautifully mentioned at the beginning and wrote uh, and read um, one of the poems of Farouk Farouzad, for um, a lot of Iranian women has been a venue, a platform um, for uh, bodily um, expression of uh, things forgiven, things um, uh, forbidden in, in their culture and in the society. Um, and for me as well, I think uh, growing up in a, you know, in a context where um, a lot of words and a lot of deeds have been forbidden um, and considered as a taboo. Uh, existing on the page has been a way to um, give voice to those forbidden uh, deeds and beliefs. Um, from a very young age, I found poetry uh, a liberating force. 
Um, and somehow, I think, as um, our former speakers also mentioned, because we come from a culture where poetry is so much loved and adored and respected, um, somehow to exist on, a pa on the page differently and uh, rebelliously um, could, be, uh, could be even appreciated as if it's, it's sort of an extension of the self where um, it is allowed to be, to exist in a certain way that we can't really allow, we are not really allowed to exist um, in the real life. Um, I think the best example of that is that a lot of Iranian women poets write about their unveiled exper experience of unveiling that is very relevant to today's discussion. I think Fatima Akhtasari's work um, speaks to that really well. Um, a lot of this type of work could exist on the page in the country, within that context, although censorship is always a problem, of course. But um, as soon as we want to um, sort of exercise those in real life, we get into trouble. Um, so I think poetry is a very interesting and empowering venue for a lot of uh, women writers who come from Iran. At the same time, it could be quite troubling, um, depending on how outspoken you could be um, on the page. It, it, it's it's really awe-inspiring uh, to witness the power of poetry and also the reverence for poetry in your country, um, which I cannot say the United States shares. Um, it, it's really wonderful to see. Uh, there's a poet that you have chosen to share with us tonight, an Afghani poet, uh, Mahbuba Ibrahimi, who was raised in Iran and whose poetry collection, Through the Mirror You Look at My Mouth, was published in her home country a month before the Taliban seized power in August, 2021. And I'm grateful that you are giving us a chance to hear her poems. Uh, these are your translations, as I understand it? Yes, um, so I just wanted to say a couple of words, whatever I said about Persian poetry and women writing tradition also is applicable to the case of Afghan, Afghanistan. And Mahbub Ibrahimi is one of the most uh, wonderful, brilliant uh, women poets of Afghanistan who has been a really powerful voice over the past few decades. So shall I read the poem? Yes, please. Okay, so I will read the poem in Persian. Um, I'm grateful to Mahbube. She's not here tonight that, you know, she has allowed me to work on her poems. She has been a wonderful friend and um, I worked on these poems and translations very closely with her. Um, this poem that I'm going to read in Persian first is called Kilim or Gelim. Joy peyda nemitavanim ruy zamin man be andaze yek otaq, be andaze yek gelim. Hatta be andaze ya amadan akharin dard fursat nadarim. پس باید بچه های من را در هواپیما ها بذاییم و در کمپ ها شیرشان بدهیم و بگذاریم در سرزمین دیگران زبان باز کنند و یک روز ناگهان از ما بپرسند ما از کجاییم حواسمان باشد سرانگشت نازکشان را نسوزانیم وقتی آن را روی نقشه and the translation reads, On the earth, we can't find a place the size of a little room, the size of a little kilim. We don't have the time for the last bit of pain when it arrives. Hence, we must give birth to our children on the airplanes breastfeed them inside the camps, raise them in the country of others, where one day they speak the first words of their mother tongue. And one day suddenly they ask us, whereabouts do we come from? Be cautious not to burn their gentle finger fingertips when they point to the map to touch where we once called homeland.
country of others where one day they speak their first words of their mother tongue. And we know there's a, there's a really big history about that relationship to having your mother tongue. Which makes yeah, that particular um, line, actually, it's interesting because there, uh, there was a confusion in the original with the translation that I first rendered. And I'm really grateful to Mahbube to share her perspective. I thought what she meant in the poem, in the original poem, was that they would start speaking the language of the land of others or the country of others while what she meant was to speak their mother tongue. So that's another layer of exile that yeah. is hidden in the poem. And I think it's fascinating how she contrasts that um, relationship between the mother tongue and the land of exile. Yeah, well, these are brilliant poems and that's another book um, that we'll be sharing access to. Um, Fatima, gave, you gave us such exquisite, long, fabulous book list that we'll be sharing with everyone. The poems of yours that you send to us are searing and passionate looks at abortion, love, loss, revolution. I mean, you go, you just go, you go, you go all the way in and they, they pierce us. It's such potent work. Would you please read us some of your work? Sure. Um, just a couple of words about these poems, which are a little bit older than um, the poem. The, the very last one that I will share also. Um, these are, as you mentioned, written um, are themes that I thought are relevant uh, to our, to our um, event tonight. Um, and I guess that also tells you that, you know, these are the questions and the, um, and the sort of issues and struggles that we, have, we Iranian women have been entangling with for, for really decades, even centuries. Um, so the first poem uh, is called The Fetus, and I will read it in English because we don't have time. I will skip the Persian uh, original. And the translations are by Dick Davis, by the way. Blood drips, the child falls in the well. Tonight, a woman falls from the ladder of moonlight. moonlight. Blood drips from exile's filthy moment here, from love, from lust, from anger, anxious fear. Blood drips from pent-up sorrow that, that has died, from cold and silent moment side by side, from your picture's frame from which you've gone, from my memories and from this ancient song. From me whose pain each day feeds my mad yearning, from old wounds, from this year of human burning, the child within my blood, how calm she lies. Tonight she falls into the well and dies. The child of all my, my the child of all my life, my heart, blood smeared, and from these smears a woman's ghost appeared. Would that I drunk my blood one drop beside my child tonight at peace, I would have died. This was a poem about abortion. Um, and um, I just want to say that the fight of Iranian women today is really the fight of women around the world, particularly women in US who are also fighting for the, their right um, to have a choice how to treat and how to decide about their body and, um, and themselves. And the second poem is called When They Broke Down the Door. And this poem is dedicated to um, the mothers, wives, lovers, and sisters of, um, of the political prisoners who were executed over the past four decades um, by the Islamic Republic. When they broke down the door, I was in your arms, like a freezing cold lullaby curled in your ear. When they broke down the door, you gripped me tightly. I was the cloth on your body on that night filled with fear. Beneath their kicks and their curses, 
You were naked and I was naked. I was your body dripping blood, unconscious, my dear. You fell and your calm gaze faltered and failed as though I were something you'd forgotten year after year. When they took you, I was a grief-stricken cry, a silent sea where your fabulous creatures appear. I was a sadness cracked open, calm in the midst of your file that was folded now, smudged and unclear. And though they have hanged you in memory's image, I see myself there in your arms, my dear. Though I were something you'd forgotten, and then later I was a sadness cracked open. These are these are magnificent in in English, and I'm sure that the music which we've gotten to hear tonight at Farsi they must be absolutely fabulous. We will be sharing them in both languages in the handout. Thank you for sending them that way. That Thank to me, I want I wanted to ask you. Um, I want to say something about your other poem because it it just blew my heart open. And so when when we're faced with atrocity and soul excavating loss, I think all of us, um, all poets, all writers struggle with the paradox of finding language to express those depths. And you really take that on in your poem, This Is Not a Poem. It holds that tension and it just stays right there in the unresolvable, the irresolvable, and it speaks exactly and like an arrow to the unspeakable. Um, would you read Thank that? you, Judith. I'm really moved and honored um, by your words. And, and this is the first time actually that I have the opportunity to read this poem, to share it with um, an audience in English. And thank you for giving me that opportunity. This is a poem I, I wrote uh, in response to the ongoing revolution in Iran. And it, it was a period of time for a couple of weeks where I was really struggling to get myself and my words and my mind together and to respond to this in, in, in a language, in, in, in the you know, in something called poetry where the trauma um, comes out, but also liberates you from itself um, and allows you to, to be able to, to, to deal with it, really to handle, you know, so much pain. And the more I tried, the, the more I failed. Um, and I just kept remembering Adorno's words. Um, I, in no way that I don't want to compare the atrocities that happened to the Jewish people, but I think, you know, the pain and the response that poetry brings, it's something that probably um, is, 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 a shared, is a shared pain. And um, so this poem really came to me as I was um, trying to sleep for a few nights and it was really unsettling to just um, bring that to poetry without making it feel in any way um, romantic. There is nothing romantic and romanticized about what's happening. So that's how this poem came out. And, and, and the translation is by um, Armand Davoudian, uh, himself an Armenian Iranian poet. This is not a poem. It's a feast full of blood splattered on mute newspapers on the Capitol's newsstands. It's a kind of throwing, the sudden throwing of rebellious girls from the roofs of the side streets of Revolution Street. This is not a poem. It's the forced confession of an eyewitness, the deterioration of the language worn down by the chronicle of successive gunshots. A fat worm crawls through the poem and one by one swallows the termites from the faces of the words, tortured words buried under a heap of blood. This is not a poem. It's the guts of a 10 year old who dreamt of inventing the rainbow God one day. It's a chain made of the throbbing of torn bodies in nameless graves, cut hairs, scratched 
cheeks. Once midnight, once the midnight strikes, the words will begin to assault each other. They will draw guns on each other. The past verbs will take present tenses hostage. Temples of adverbs of time and space will be shot by live bullets. This is not a poem. It's the wounded body of a 15-year-old festering from successive rapes. It's the torn up chest of a captive laborer who laughed at his torturer until the last blow. This is not a poem. It's the life story of an executioner who brings home fresh bread every night with the blood money of rebellious poets. Before morning comes, the corpse of these words will be on the hands of these white pages. And one by one, they will fall into eternal sleep in a crowded mass grave with fattened, with fattened insects. This is not a poem. For weeks, words have been hung up here by their feet. The hands of metaphors and light have been chained to iron fences and water denied to the throat of the dry tongue of this song. Alas, alas, like these words, we were also unarmed and their fists were full of stones and their bodies were naked like the moments they were born from the womb of the mother tongue. This is not a poem. This thing running in my mouth, it's the fluctuation of a suffering order that runs wounded and naked in the streets of the city and falls to ground at the newsstands. Thank you. Oh my, um, Fatima, I mean, for you to transform the words in your poem into warriors. Um, words will draw guns and take present tense hostage. Uh, words will um, hung up by their feet. I mean, the words, I've never seen words so viscerally transformed into, um, into something so powerful. Uh, I, I can see why you lost a lot of sleep over this one. And you did something that's very difficult to do in a poem to, to transform that kind of rage into something, um, something meaningful um, and really powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your words. And I feel like it's a voice. I mean, when, I, when you were reading it, I was also thinking of the people in Ukraine. I mean, I was thinking of so many people for whom this poem, this poem, Myanmar, there's so many people around the world for whom this poem is truth. This poem, this poem says. Thank you. I'm I'm very glad to, and and I'm I'm grateful to those comments and I'm glad it makes sense because it I, it was a for me it was a very sort of avant-garde take on the language itself and how how grief and trauma could be actually translated into poetry if we don't want to um, betray the, the 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 visceral reality around us. It's a fine line and also not playing not playing to the audience with it either so we it's like holding that exact place of grief and the brutality of it but but you but it's such a gorgeously written poem that the kind of the aesthetic holds us in the place of observance and keeps us bearing witness bearing witness bearing witness with you yeah Thank you, Judith. I, I'm very glad it makes sense in English. <laughs> yes, very much so. Thank you so much, Pat. Thank you for that to me. Thank you. And we are now so honored to bring you our, our guest who helped us so much with the language and translation and understandings tonight, Dr. Farangis Gadari. Welcome, Farangis. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Slot and Levit. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much um, for all of you, um, to all of you for putting this panel together. Dr. Farangis Gadiri 
is a first generation Kurdish scholar and currently the joint director of the Center for Kurdish Studies at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies of the University of Exeter. She is coming tonight to us very, very late from England, from London, I believe. She is the principal investigator of the Kurdish component of the Digital Archives of the Middle East Project at Exeter University. She's the co-editor of this phenomenal book, Women's Voices from Kurdistan, and the author of many, many, many peer-reviewed articles on Kurdish literature and culture. And she is a magnificent translator of Kurdish poetry. And I just, from my heart, want to thank you for making these poems available to to English speakers, Farangis, this is a huge gift that you've given us. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank you so much uh, for your kind, uh, kind words and introduction. Thank you. Farangis, you are a powerful force for Kurdish studies, poetry, language, culture. Uh, thank you so much for your translation of Sharish's Lament, which we read at the start of this when we opened. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit more about your work? Um, it's, it's clearly a work of, of passion as well as necessity, is it not? Um, it is indeed. Um, um, if you allow me to say just a few words on the lament that we shared at the start mm -hmm. of our event. Um, uh, when I heard um, uh, uh, Shorish's mother lament um, over her son's um, grave, um, it, re it really shook me and it didn't leave me for days. And it was her words uh, was with me, um, days and nights. Um, and um, I was thinking that um, um, uh, the world needs need to hear this. The, 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 she has to be heard. And I'm so grateful that um, through this event, uh, we, have, we have made her, her voice heard. And thank, I, I thank Judith for her help with uh, my translation, the refi refining the translation. Um, so in Iran, Kurdish has no official status, nor is it the medium of instruction in public education. Um, even though it is the language of over 10 million people uh, just in Iran. So I taught myself Kurdish and uh, it was my dream to do my PhD on Kurdish literature on Kurdish poetry. And to pursue that dream, um, I had to leave Iran, um, which was not a light decision to make, especially for a woman. Um, but, um, but I suppose it was a way of resistance, and it has been. Um, Kurdish literature is a very rich literary tradition uh, that deserves to be heard. And to make Kurdish literature and culture known through scholarly works, my scholarly work, and translation is, is, um, is my commitment to my language. It was an exquisite experience getting, getting to work with you on Thank that you. and to be able to give something, something back. Um, you also, you know, there's such a, you, you've given us such a richness in your books. I wonder tonight, um, you had offered to share the work of two uh, important Kurdish poets that you love and would you please introduce the contemporary poet Dia Juan and share her poem for us? Thank you. Um, sure, it's, it's my pleasure to share these poems with you and everyone who are with us. Uh, thank you. Um, so um, political activism, resistance and exile are all part of uh, uh, the life of most Kurdish poets. Um, and it is important to note the transnational nature of Kurdish struggle. As one of the largest nations without a state of their own and scattered in Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, um, they have faced the denial of their identity and they have faced linguicide. So um, they have been caught up in struggling and, and fighting uh, for recognition in their home countries. And to illustrate this, um, I'm reading a poem. I decided to read a poem by Dia Juan, who is, uh, uh, she's, she's originally from a serious Kurdish region, but currently lives in Iraqi Kurdistan. And she's one of the most celebrated contemporary Kurdish poets. 
um, but she's also a political activist um, um, uh, and a politician and mm -hmm. sits as the central committee of the Kurdish Democratic Party of Syria. Uh, when her first book was published, uh, just to illustrate the transnational nature of Kurdish struggle, um, when her first book was published in Kurdish in 1992 in Syria, she was arrested several times. And her book was consequently um, uh, 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 destroyed. But she continued, she continued writing and has published at, um, over 10 books of poetry and short story. Uh, but she also has worked as, as a seamstress for 40 years uh, as a way of supporting her family. And the poem I've chosen, uh, which is included uh, in, in, the, in the volume that you mentioned kindly, uh, Women's Voices from Kurdistan, uh, The Needle is a tribute to the tool that has accompanied her all her life and has made her economically um, an independent woman. And she writes in Kermanji dialect. Derzi. Ve derziye çikiriye u çenekiriye. Bevi kalafeti bıçuk kare kesin gekikiriye. Men besere ve ye ziraf deve birçibune duru tu khazani bingor kiriye. Çeke mine gran ewa. Jekhancerek tuştire. Jehemi gütinin kalav jehattiru kerhattire. Her ku de nav deste minda de chilvile, khna de bin neinoke bevi shirintira. Dema der dore vi javi nigar deka, deshtu bayarin jiane tevchut deka. Bebejna we her as chave hot kil dekum. Bekuria we setune jian, setune jiane heldedem. Kujarik jemen wenda de be. Behawari ledegarum Takuroni, je chow nagare, jewe nagarum. As to jari, we beshure shame nagaharum. Thank you. I'm going to read your translation in, in English. So much this needle has done. With her tiny body, she did the work of a plowshare. With her delicate tip, I sewed shut the mouth of hunger and buried destitution. She's my heavy weapon, sharper than a dagger, handier than big words. When she gleams in my hand, the blood under my fingernail turns sweet. On my fabric, she plows the plains and the fallow land of life. With her shaft, I coal my eyes. With her sharp end, I raise the pillar of life. If she drops out of sight, I shall look for her, crying for help. For as long as there is light in my eyes, I shall never leave her nor swap her for the sword of Damascus. I love, I love that poem. Thank you both. I love that. The, the needle. Uh, yeah. You also um, um, you, uh, you chose a poem by Sheila um, Sheila Husseini, uh, a young poet whose life was tragically cut short at the age of thirty-two. Uh, would you um, introduce her and read her poem as well? Yes. Um, apologies. I need to make a correction. The the translation of the needle is is not by me. It's, it's by oh. Dr. Clement Scalvert Ugel. But uh, the translation of Gina uh, Gila Seni that I'm sharing is my translation. Um, so um, uh, Gila uh, was uh, was born in 1964 in the city of Saqiz in Iran. Um, and Saqiz is 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 uh, Gina Masa Amini's hometown which happens to be my hometown as well. Um, uh, but like many of her peers in Iran, Gila began her writing career by writing in Persian. And she taught herself Kurdish. And that's the story of, of many writers and poets in Iran. They, you, you teach yourself Kurdish. Um, she was married at the age of 15 and divorced at 20. Um, so she was well acquainted with the suffering of women. And that has really reflected in her poems. 
Um, we started by reading uh, Furugh Farrogzad, and parallels have been made uh, between um, Gila Husseini and Furugh. Um, uh, they share um, actually many similarities in both the, the personal life, divorce, early death, as well as the language um, and the provocative language and the content. Um, despite her short life, she has left a strong legacy in Kurdish literature and has inspired generations of Kurdish women in Iran. Um, and the poem that um, I share with you, uh, question, uh, Persiar, um, is, uh, I thought, relevant uh, to our event. I, I read uh, the, the poem in Kurdish, uh, and it is, uh, this poem is in uh, the Sorani dialect of Kurdish. Persiar. Ser poşa şırak key dəykim dəsbərdəri sərim nəbi. Alay, min hi dəpirətim. Rəngə əviş lə dəpirəy xoyəvə bəcəb qoy bəcəm əbi. Ser işim pəncərəy təq bazi bərəv asmanəv. Həzəkə rojan miwandəri hətəv bəkətu şəvaniş məngu əstərə. Çavil key ki qətrənişim lə dəykim bu mavətəvə. Alay, Dinya haramaya toaybini. Legal har girmei haureka. Qachki sat persiari. Dupatu tazash. La chawan ma halatoqet. Thank you. Thank you, Farangi. I'm struck by what you said that the poet had to learn Kurdish. And a word I heard earlier, linguicide. Um, it's, it's a chilling word to wipe out a culture and a language. And it's so wonderful that she uh, learned the language again. Um, I'll read the poem in English. Um, question. My mother's worn scarf does not leave my head alone. It says, I am your grandmother's. It might have been her grandmother's too. And my head is an open window to the sky wishing to host the sun at day and the moon and the stars at night. My mother also left a pair of pitch black glasses. It says, this is the world as you see it. With every thunderclap, a mushroom of a hundred questions old and new sprout in my eyes. Mm. Thank you so much, Barangis. Pleasure. This was really a thrilling presentation. Um, please stay on stage, Barangis, because now we want to invite all our guests back on the stage for a conversation followed by Q&A. And we have, we have more comments in our Q&A than we've had on anything that Catherine and I have presented. Um, you can really feel our audience wanting to be in conversation with you and sending hearts and claps the entire time for your work. I, this is really, I can really feel the just incredible warmth and passion of our audience for you guys tonight. It's really something. So yes. we, we've had a, a huge audience tonight. Um, one of the easiest questions, um, I, I might just direct this to Judith. People are asking, what are the names of these poems? How can I read them? Where will I find them? Will, will there be a recording of this presentation? And Judith, please share how this recording uh, will be shared as well. Well, the first thing is the we make a we'll make a YouTube video that will be absolutely shareable the way all YouTube videos are. It'll be on the Poetry Mesa channel. Everyone who is here tonight will be able to find that easily on YouTube. And I guess we'll send it out. We'll send out the link because we're going to send every single person a handout because in the preparation of, of this presentation tonight, we got to work with and learn so much from our guests that we want to share all of that with you. We want to share the poems in all the languages that we have. And we're going to share a phenomenal reading list and you'll be able to see really basically you'll get a piece of paper you'll get paper with everything that you got to hear tonight no worries and i know we've had so many requests for the lament for Angis. we've got yeah so we'll we're definitely going to be sharing um her translation of that with you all yeah 
One of the questions, I think it was directed to Abba, but it might also be an interesting question for everyone. The question was, do you write a poem in English and translate it? Uh, what language do you write in first? And then do you translate it or does somebody else translate it? That was um, a question that, that one person asked. And, and I think it was directed to Abba, so maybe Abba could answer that first. Yeah, um, so I have been writing since childhood and there have been stages my writing. Um, initially, I also wrote in Persian because that was the language of education. I didn't have access to my mother tongue. And uh, later in life, it, interestingly enough, after exile, I had, because up until then, all I was doing was surviving. And there came a moment of tranquility that allowed me to go deeper, investigate my identity. And I realized how much this um, lack of access to mother tongue was hurting me on so many deep levels. And so I made a point of teaching myself Kurdish. So then I started writing in Kurdish and then came the sense of, wait a minute, I have um, this gift of being able to write in English because I majored in English and I have always loved writing and English literature. And because I grew up in Kurdistan and now I live in North America, maybe I can be a bridge. Because a lot of people who grow up in North America and can grow up with English, they don't have access to an authentic Kurdish world. And the ones who, like me, grew up there, they don't have access to English language. And so since then, which was about 15 years ago, I shifted to writing in English. So now when I write in English, I write in English. I don't translate. I think in English and plan it in English. And, and when I write in Kurdish, I think in Kurdish. When I write in Farsi, I think in Farsi. Um, I haven't done a lot of translation. It's a whole different mental power for, for translators. I am so amazed by translators. Thank you. And is anyone it, else? Go ahead. Go ahead, Judith. Can I ask, can I, I'm, I'm going to ask um, a friend of ours, wonderful poet herself, Wezi, um, from Malawi, has asked Farangis, um, you said that leaving home was a hard decision that you had to make. Have you been able to cope in exile? And do you find the work you do fulfilling? And the same she wants to hear from all of you on your experiences of exile in relation to your work. Um, thank you. Um, I guess what I do is a way of coping, um, both my research and the translation. But it is a very difficult, uh, very painful um, journey. It's, uh, it's not easy. It makes the, it makes the far away near, but also makes you always know that it's far. What about you, Fatime? Fatime E. <laughs> You're you're living in Norway. That has to be just a radical. Yeah. Can exile. can you repeat the question? Well, she wanted to know how what what's the relationship of your living in exile to your yeah. work. Yeah, of course, the experience of a writer has some effects on the what you write, but it's not just my own experience. I use for for writing. I use some other inspiration like the others uh, um, the others life the others the experiences and also my imagination so i have these two and i can use these two uh from the other side of the world not just from iran but i have my own experiences right now is uh, in Norway and of course if it, with new people with new language with new literature atmosphere and of course this uh, effect on my works. Shehrazad, Shehrazad. Yes uh, so I I guess I would say um, it really has a um, multi-dimensional effect if you like in the sense that sure on the surface um the very first thing that it affects is the loss of mother tongue that i think a lot of exiles from different lands have uh experienced and gone through that and it's really um the most painful i would say experience of exile for for me too has been the change um 
and the sort of slow deterioration of the mother tongue and the relationship that you have with, with your mother tongue over time. Um, I have been, and I, it really depends on the geography of your exile and how much time you spend. So my relationship three, four years ago and 10 years ago, and now has changed significantly with the with my you know with with Iran and with with Persian language on the other hand I think it uh, exile could be also empowering and liberating in the sense that it brings a, a part of the self on the surface where you cannot you, you could not experience if you never experienced exile and uh, opening you to other languages other possibilities of imagination and thinking about poetry and relating to poetry in a different way um, when you have a chance to communicate and interact with poets of other languages. And then I, I think for all of us on this panel, also the relationship that we have with the, with the translation, whether we are the translated subject or we are the translator, um, and you know the, the the relationship. I I see in the comments uh, somebody asked why didn't I translate my own poetry and I translate other people's poetry. It's a it's a terrific question. I could never translate my own poetry, and the reason is that um, I will write a completely entirely different poem if I start writing it in English. Um, and I have tried to do that. I mean the subject matter could be the same, but um, the way that the poem is written in Persian, in my mind, and, uh, and in English, I will deal with that subject matter differently given, you know, what language I'm written, I'm, I'm writing in. So I think those are all fascinating findings and understandings of exile for me with, in relation to poetry and language. That's a fantastic question. Um, I wanted to ask you, Ava, the, the passion and the scholarship and the clarity in your essay the path to freedom in Iran in Iran is through women and minorities. And I just wondered if you would speak a little bit to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this has been like my fellow panelists discussed this. Uh, rising up has been both inspiring and devastating. Um, and it takes a lot for some of us to put ourselves together and think about it and maybe create some kind of distance, artistic distance from us to be able to look at it and see what might change this time. Um, and I stand by my words that the more I look at what is happening, that I see that intersectionality is the difference between winning and losing. It's the difference between actually bringing about democracy or just the pretense of it. Um, having one of the advantages, and I love how Fatima articulated this, one of the advantages of having lived elsewhere and then picking up your life and having to sit down roots elsewhere is, especially for some of us who have experienced life in the East and all the flavors of the East and then here in the West, is like having access to the left and right side of the collective human brain, right? And, uh, and so things that inspired me are pretty much international. And I really believe in my heart, the idea of oneness and connectivity and interbeing and interrelatedness. And it's not hard for those of us who have lived between countries to see that interconnectedness, not just in an intellectual level, but to actually embody it and see what affects you or someone in Zimbabwe today will indirectly affect me. So I'm going to go back to that idea of injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. In Iran, when in the 1980s, when the Islamic Republic first took over, two groups stood up to it. One was the Kurds. Kurds were against this government from its very beginning, but they were alone. They were alone until 2022, when the funeral of Jinnah started this massive process. And women in Iran also, when hijab became mandatory, and it became mandatory in stages, it wasn't right away made completely mandatory. In 1980, women staged a very large scale protest against it, but men failed to support that. They thought this is, you know, this is not a priority. And so that failing to understand that what happens to women today, what happens to first today is going to affect all of us 15 years or so, 40 years from now, not seeing that perspective empowers the oppressive regime and weakens connection, weakens interconnection. 
And today we have this young generation who has the intuition and understanding that if we centralize, marginalize groups, we empower everyone. And I see our society on one hand, understanding that and embracing minorities and women one day and the day after being full of fear and pushing them aside and embracing them. So there's this expansion and contraction. And if we can actually put our fears aside and we can actually trust women and minorities, we will have true democracy. I, I want to ask a question of, of Fatima Ekstasari. Uh, how can artists and especially writers and poets help the Iranian revolution at this moment? Um, writers and artists actually uh, have been the pioneers of this movement. I think they have informed and awakened uh, people through their writings. And now uh, they are helping this revolution by supporting this movement and standing with the people by um, recounting facts and events in uh, their art, uh, by enlightening the world community and uh, drawing the attention of politicians to this revolution. So their role is so important. I'd like to finish with one last question for Farengis. Um, I'd love you to just talk a little bit about the, the things that you've said to us about poetry for the Kurds as a way of life. Um, thank you. Um, so um, I, I'd like to um, share a quote, a quote by uh, Sherko Bekes, the legendary Kurdish poet who famously said in an interview to understand, I quote, to understand the history of Kurds, you need to read Kurdish poetry. And this is not an exaggerated account at all. Um, poetry for Kurds, uh, uh, like, like the neighboring nations, is a way of existence, uh, existing, is a way of life and an important tool of transmitting knowledge. Poetry is recited and improvised, as we saw in, in the example of uh, the lament at the beginning of our event, is improvised and recited in weddings, burials, funerals, so sad and happy occasions. And is, it is an act of resistance um, and remembrance. Um, uh, and this is very evident in over the past few months, what we have seen um, in Kurdistan, the resistance in Kurdistan, um, the videos, um, uh, the clips, you know, coming from Iranian Kurd Kurdish um, areas in Iran, um, uh, we see that the resistance um, is accompanied by vivid expressions of Kurdish identity. Um, and most notably, um, singing Kurdish songs, um, revolutionary songs and reciting poetry. So through this means through poetry and song, they cry out against uh, the dictatorship uh, like their fellow Iranians, but they are also crying out against the denial of their identity, the erasure of their names, uh, embodied in the way that uh, the name of uh, uh, Gina was erased, um, uh, the, the erasure of uh, the language and culture. Um, poetry has played an integral uh, role in Kurdish uprisings uh, throughout the Kurdish modern history uh, specifically, and uh, it has accompanied revolutions. And um, as we see today, it continues to be the site of resistance and remembrance. Well, we're gonna close with another fiery and inspiring example of an unsilenced and unsilenceable Iranian woman. Another gift in translation of Ferengis to us. We have a video of Zara Mohammadi, a Kurdish teacher and language activist who was originally sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for teaching Kurdish, mostly in remote rural areas, but her sentence was reduced to five years after her appeal. So we'll see this. Catherine, um, I'm going to invite Farangis to introduce this for us, okay? Okay. Uh, sure. Um, so Zara Mohammadi, um, as, as uh, you said, Judith, um, is um, a Kurdish language teacher, an activist, and uh, the co-founder of Nojin Cultural Association. And she was sentenced uh, originally to 10 years in prison, but now she's serving five years imprisonment. 
for her activism, for teaching Kurdish. And so she, she embodies the struggle of Kurdish language in Iran. Um, on the day that she began her prison term, uh, this was in January 2022, um, she, um, she, she was always dressed in Kurdish costume, as we will see in the video, uh, proudly. And uh, she gave a speech, uh, a fiery speech, in front of the prison um, to, to among um, uh, uh, supporters and admirers. Uh, so, so she gave this speech um, uh, to the people who had gathered in her support. And in her speech, she recited um, a poem. Uh, it's a famous poem by Hane. Um, the poem is on prison. And she, uh, that, and she's, she basically says that uh, her determ determination will only grow stronger in prison. And uh, her prison term is not an end to her activism, uh, to which we will see the audience uh, clap passionately. But Khan himself is, uh, uh, he was born in 1898 and uh, passed away in 1965. Uh, he, he's a fascinating poet, not, unfortunately, um, not, uh, uh, his poetry has not been translated in, into English. He's, um, he was originally from Iran, but he was forced into a life of exile in Iraq, in Iraq and Kurdistan. But he experienced prison. He was in prison in both Iran and Iraq for his writing. Now I'm going to share with you, because we are so blessed that Farangis has translated this poem of Hanes into English. And here it is. The corner of this prison is my final abode. This handcuff cures my wounded, passionate heart. Our enemy thinks I will be silenced in prison. Let him know the corner of this prison is my school. Arresting, beating, killing, grant me freedom. His guns and handcuffs are fairy tales for me. I pity that enemy whose hope is prison. Here, I grow stronger. Here, my resolve grows only stronger. My revolutionary weapon, my writing, and my tenacity. Standing up, striving, roaring the Kurdish way. Doomed, cursed, lost are those who bow to the enemy. Hane is free in prison today. Marvelous. Thank you, Judith, for that powerful reading. Um, before we close tonight, just a reminder that we will be sharing all of the poems and books measured that we mentioned tonight and an extensive reading list as well. All of that will be sent to everyone who registered for this program. We have your email uh, addresses for that. And please go to our website and join our mailing list at poetrymesa.com uh, where you can follow our programs as well. That will be listed in the chat, our, um, our URL. We owe enormous gratitude 
to our guests. Thank you, thank you, Ava, Fatima, Shahrazad, and Farangis. And thank you, my partner, Catherine, Catherine Frank. Thank you so much. And of course, we give our ever and enormous gratitude to our technical directors, Tina Bika and Patty Garcia, who are our production team and who sponsor the Poetry Mesa through the San Miguel Literary Sala. Thank you. Thank you for hosting us. And we want to thank you, our beloved audience, without whom the circle of gift would not be complete. So tonight, we are beautifully filled by this feast of beauty, of grief, resistance, strength that we have shared. The Spanish poet Gabriel Salaya said, Poesia es un arma cargada del futuro. Poetry is a weapon loaded with the future. Together tonight, we have celebrated the fiery, nuanced, urgent poetry of our Iranian comrades and all of our futures. Thank you. Thank you. Jean Jian Azadi, women, life, freedom. Thank you, everyone. What a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>